Hello, welcome to Artworks. We are so excited to have you join us each month for a different meaning of the word art in Stanley County and our region. We have brought you theater, we have brought you music, we have brought you the gallery of the different kind of arts. And we are so excited because the feedback gets more and more when people tell us how much they appreciate our program. So welcome again. And this is a different type of program today as we try to make each one of them. For today, we are going to share with you the creativity of some folks in this region who are potters themselves, who have potteries, who show their works at different shows or maybe just have it in our own gallery, the Falling Rivers Gallery. You will remember how we showed you just a smattering there. But today, this entire program is dedicated to three different artists in our region who have the wonderful art of pottery and have shared it with so many. I think you'll find it real interesting how they got into it, what they do with it now, where you can find it, and what it takes to be a potter. So I want you to sit back and relax and enjoy this journey that we have taken into the area into the sites so you can see what it takes to really make a beautiful piece of pottery that you enjoy. the beginning of the show that we were going to have the wonderful opportunity today to interview some local potters. How wonderful it is that now we are known also for having the artisan pottery uh, industry here as well as the creativity of our own people. And uh, Nancy, it is a delight to have you back with us. Thank you and welcome to my studio. And a totally different setting. <laughs> Our folks will under remember and understand that we did have Nancy with us before because she does manage our wonderful Falling Rivers Gallery and is very involved in the arts in the area. And uh, we thought it would just be a wonderful time to visit some of our local artists who are potters. And so now we're interviewing you, Nancy, as a potter at, on, on your own right and here in your own studio. Right. So thank you very much for having us here. Talk to me uh, about the art of pottery, and uh, first of all, let's focus on how much do we have in this area? In Stanley County alone, um, I can name at least eight potteries. Uh, in the gallery, we have people from Rowan County as well, uh, uh, and Montgomery County, of course. Um, so if you count all those, the Pottery Guild that we formed um, back in 2008 was uh, 15 potteries. That's awesome. It's yeah. awesome. I recently did a presentation about products of the state of North Carolina and made reference back to what we used to be known for. Uh -huh. And that was textiles and tobacco and furniture. And how now that we are known for totally different things. Yes. And among those things was the, is the pottery. And also, we're not just known in one particular area over in Randolph County and, the, and the, that area where I went to high school and grew up, but now in our own region. So thank you for telling us how many of those that there are, because I think most of our people will be surprised at that. What's the name of your pottery? My pottery is called Into the Fire Pottery. It makes reference to my career days when the phrase was out of the frying pan and into the fire. <laughs> How neat. As long as I've known you, I did not know where the name came from. That is awesome. That's awesome. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, I started doing um, clay back in 2004 when I first got to Stanley County. I registered at Montgomery Community College um, and got my certificate in advanced clay. 
uh, from Montgomery Community College, started my business in 2007. So I, as far as potteries go, this is a very young pottery. We've, um, I've only been selling work for five years. But that's awesome. So you, had you had an interest in it before you got here? A little bit, just a little bit. I just, I moved here, I was a little lost as to what to do. And I knew there was pottery in this area. And when I saw an ad for the community college in the Stanley News and Press, I just said, well, that'll be something to keep me occupied. And so I, of course, most of us started as a hobby and then quickly decide that in order to invest in a studio and a kiln and all this, you're going to sell. So it became right. a business right away. Well, you led me to a wonderful tr uh, point there as well to thank here again uh, the community college system that we have in North Carolina. Absolutely. And this is, of course, uh, produced and uh, shared with the community through our own Stanley Community College. And it, I, I tout that everywhere I go about what a wonderful system that we have. And that is what brought you to where you are today. That's exactly it. To take a it, class yeah. through one of our colleges. Uh, at first, were you uh, challenged? Were you discouraged? Uh, oh, did it absolutely. take off pretty quickly? Or? Absolutely. I probably, I probably um, went through 100 pounds of clay before I centered a ball of clay. Uh, to pull up a coffee mug was probably another 100 pounds of clay. It's, um, it's a slow process. It takes a lot of um, dedication, a lot of physical strength. Um, and even now, I still feel like some days, you know, I'm just a beginner all over again. But isn't that the beauty of it, though? Yes. And I have spoken with some of the potters in just in personal conversations in years gone by about what it does for you mentally and emotionally to be working with the clay. Right. Talk to us a little bit about that. That is... Um, it's a very interesting thing. For me, I've always worked in uh, management, so I've always planned my life three weeks in the head. You know, my, I'm living three weeks ahead. When I sit down at the wheel, I must be in the present. And that is a whole mental shift that is very relaxing and um, centering. So I think that that's one of the remarkable things about pottery is it forces you, or any art, it forces yes. you to be in the present. Absolutely, and um, I think that it speaks to art itself, as you said, and how it does force us to be in the now and the balance of our lives that we can even do both, but yet to have, as you do now, but uh, the, um, help me uh, take us from the pottery, such as yourself, into the community of pottery here and how you all uh, work together and sort of how that blends. Well, when um, several of us were about to graduate from Montgomery Community College, um, we realized that the environment we were going into is now a solo one. When you're in school, you've got all these other potters sitting at wheels next to you that you can play off your ideas from, that you can get ideas from, and now you're on your own. Um, so we formed the Pottery Guild, the North Carolina Professional Potters Guild. And the idea behind that was to visit each other in each other's studios once a month, share and support new potters who may not have their own studio space by allowing them to, to, to share ours, um, learn how to market our products from each other. Um, we start, formed the first pottery show in 2008. And this year will be our fourth pottery show at the gallery, um, September 28th and 29th. And the uh, guild has kind of evolved as people have become more business minded. Um, there's less studio working, uh, but in terms of the support center that that created, um, that's still very much real and true for us. Well, I think it's absolutely great because I think when we were at the gallery and did our show from there, we just barely touched on the on the pottery side because there's so much there in the different arts. But to bring it to this level now and to take it from the very, uh, very clay to the finished products that we are able to see. So the pottery shows are getting quite popular. Yes. Uh, do most of the artists in the area uh, have places that they can show themselves or do they take it to Many, uh, the several galleries? of our potters 
uh, don't do shows. I'm, I'm kind of rare. Uh, there's probably only about four potters in the guild that do pottery shows on a regular basis. Uh, I do six to seven shows. Uh, many of them are only selling right now in Falling Rivers Gallery. Uh, you'll meet um, Judith Williams at Stony Run. They're, the only place that they sell right now is at Falling Rivers Gallery. Um, so there are several potters that are just supporting that one gallery. Um, I'm in three galleries. Besides Falling Rivers Gallery, I'm in Raven Pottery in Southern Pines and Pottery 101 in Salisbury. One last question or two. What's the most challenging thing about being a potter? Um, I would say that there's a creative process that's always difficult. I think most potters like to throw. If you're a wheel potter, you like to throw, and that's the part you like. Figuring out what you want to make, um, not just what sells, not just, but what, what is in your heart, that's the most challenging. Um, figuring that out and then taking that all the way through, I think is always, um, it's the creative, innovative process that's difficult. It's easy to sit down and mindlessly make a mug, but to make something really that speaks to who you are is always a challenge. The different finishes, the different oh, styles. The... That's one thing I was really surprised at is that how much, how many different ways there were to finish pottery. I do crystalline um, and I do raku, but I do horsehair and barrel fired raku. But I also do stoneware and I do stoneware um, at one temperature, I do it at another temperature. I participate in John Honeycutt's wood fires on occasion. That's a whole different technique with whole different glazes, different clays. Um, everything that you do is going to be slightly different, require different um, glazing techniques, different firing techniques. And uh, that's why you have to go to school, because you'll never oh. figure it out all on your own. Oh, I'm sure of that, because <laughs> I did not know there were so many different kinds of pottery. Uh, styles to do, just re recognizing the beauty of pottery is what most of us see. But I also think it likens pottery, uh, being a potter, in my mind, likens to the way we are in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, the creativity, the, the going through the fire, the, uh, the learning and the experimentation and becoming who right. we are. Right. It really feeds both the artist in me and the engineer. That's right. It does. It does. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, not only for today, uh -huh. but for what you're contributing to this art mm -hmm. in our own Stanley County and region and what you're doing at the gallery and helping other people to be able to share theirs too. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, Nancy Life has been speaking with us about her own desire and learning of the art of pottery, and we thank her very much for that. Well, I'm going to start in the middle of the process. I'm going to start in the glazing, actually. Um, you're dressed far too well for this. But oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Normally, we don the apron because I'm very sloppy. Well, I but... would love to be just like that, and I love the apron Pikes Place market. Yeah, well, that's my Seattle roots. <laughs> so the first thing, um, all this pottery has been fired one time, um, and it's mainly just so that it doesn't take on so much moisture, and I can work with it without breaking it. Um, because when it's just dry clay, it's very fragile. So it's been what is called bisque fired. Uh, most of the other, all the pots, I usually wax the bottom. And that's why there's a little frying pan here with wax and BBs. Um, BBs help me keep a nice level. Now, is wax. that not interesting? So, so I wax the bottoms of these so that they don't have any glaze on the bottom because the glaze will stick in the kiln. Mm -hmm. um, next I glaze and all these buckets are glaze buckets um, they all are for stoneware um, and so I have quite a selection although most of us tend to go back to the same three or four different combinations uh, what I'm using right now is just a white liner glaze because I like to have a nice white mug inside and a white teapot so that you can see. You have to think about the functionality of what you're trying to do. So um, 
So the fact is that you have already taken the clay, you have thrown it, you have created... I've thrown the, it. The I've object. And made so a now, foot, I trimmed it, I, and then I've waxed it, and now I'm glazing it. And so now we're yet, we're ready to glaze. And right. there are different kinds of glazes as right. we have and So um, these are mostly all my glazes. And uh, I'm going to line a mug, because I can probably do that without splattering you. And that's all right. <laughs> Don't worry. So all the glaze material is suspended in water. All right, so I am going to um, mix the glaze. And then I pour, oh, I don't know, half a cup in there. And then the trick is trying to not have it back for, but it usually does. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that gives me a nice liner. So that's one of the glazes. Um, like I said, there's, you know, I have many, many different collections of glazes that I use. Uh, I often paint, you'll see I have brushes, but mostly I dip, I pour, and I spray. I have a compressor out back. Um, for example, the crystalline is all sprayed. All spray. So uh, that means that's the mask and the safety goggles <laughs> and donning all of that, standing outside with the compressor and um, spraying all day long. So uh, you don't want to see me with is that. Is that a not amazing? It's a, it's a long process. Um, crystalline is particularly difficult because I can't have crystalline glazes sitting around. They, uh, they don't have a good shelf life. So for every crystalline firing, I mix all the glazes uniquely in small two, 300 gram batches. And then I, I takes all day to mix, takes a whole nother day to spray, and then it takes two days for the firing. So um, it's pretty much a long week. Uh, and then it's another 24 hours before I can peek and see if anything worked. Um, so, uh, and if you're doing that, like how many pieces would you be doing? I, I, my kiln is rather small. I can get about 20 to 24 pieces okay, in a kiln. Okay. Um, and, uh, that we, I usually have a certain ver number of them that don't work out. Um, so in crystalline, I, if I have only two that didn't work or that broke in the process, that's a good firing for me. Um, that is the nature of the beast, but it's what I love. I oh, like yeah. it when I don't know what it's going to be. Well, that bears out the, the uh, thought that the time that it takes, you cannot measure art in time. No. You no, cannot measure no. the time it takes for a piece of art. I would never price my no, stuff based no. on time. <laughs> So now we've done some glazing on the inside, uh -huh. and then so then I take another bucket, and um, you don't want to watch me stir because that would take hours. A lot of people use electric um, stirs, and I have one, but I never use it you because just, I don't. Them. I want to feel. I want to make sure there's no lumps in there, and I can't really feel it without putting my hand down in there and testing it out. So. So I, I mix everything with a little paint spray, uh, mixer and it just takes a long time. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll dip those pieces and then I'll go back on these and I will spray them with a, a light blue. So it'll be at least three steps on, on the mugs themselves. So the one that you just, that you glazed on the inside. Uh -huh. So what would, what would be the next step now for that? The next that? step would be, um, I would mix this green. Mix the green. And I would dip it in dip the green. It. And that, the thing I like about that green is it highlights all this texturing that I've done when I threw the okay. piece. Okay, okay. And then, so I'll mix the green, I'll dip it, and then I'll come back through and I'll spray a, a blue ash glaze over it to highlight certain areas. So, and so once those glazings are done, right. then that's when we're ready to right. go out. And, and so I, where are we now, Nancy? Okay, so process. this is the kiln. Um, this is the last firing. Uh, my kiln is uh, electric. It runs up to about 2,330 degrees total. Um, this room will get really hot oh, when, that, I can <laughs> when, when that happens. Um, but 
Luckily, the only time I fire it that hot is when I'm doing the crystalline. It'll go um, up the, about that high. Uh, but then I take it back down and I hold for about five hours at different temperatures to grow the crystals. Um, in stoneware, uh, most of everything I'm firing is uh, less than 2,200 degrees. Uh, this is a 7.2 cubic foot kiln, so mm -hmm. it will hold about 20 pieces. Um, those discs behind you are its shelves, and there are stilts and shelves, and you just basically build up build from the up. bottom. So um, basically, I, I load, I put another shelf, I load again, I put another shelf until I get to the top. Um, I usually fire overnight because it's cooler at night, um, and it finishes up sometime in the morning, um, and the next morning I can unload. Uh, so that's the process. So the kiln and it stays in and it yeah. stays through the processing time and then... And then I take it out often. I will, um, I like to have a really smooth bottom on the, because they're not glazed. So I have a grinder that I could go smooth the bottoms down before I, I sell them. And then I price them and pack them in these bins for the next show delivery or to the delivery next show. to the next show or gallery or whatever. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this is an absolute amazing process. And uh, I think that our, our viewers are going to really enjoy seeing and hearing what it looks like up close. have been enjoying this excursion through the land of pottery in Stanley County today. And as we promised earlier in the program when we introduced this, we were going to visit some of the local potters and see what this wonderful, wonderful art form is, what it takes to produce these beautiful pieces of pottery, and that is exactly what we've done. And we're visiting now with another one of our local potters in Oakboro, and this is the Stony Run Pottery, and it's Judith and Jerry Williams and Gary Surratt. And uh, we are delighted to come and visit with them, and we're going to talk to them a little bit about, as we have the others, uh, how they got started and just uh, what this means to them in their lives. So, Judith, when did you start in pottery? Well, about four years ago, we took um, a workshop that was being sponsored by Falling Rivers, and there was a potter there uh, named Sid Luck, who is well known to this area. Yes, he is. And uh, we really enjoyed the workshop, and uh, Gary especially enjoyed it. And uh, so he decided to sort of ferret out where we could get more education and become potters. And as a result of that, we started uh, taking classes at Montgomery Community College in their pottery department. Oh yes, everybody mentions, Montgom mentions Montgomery, and that's awesome. And as I told you earlier before the show, uh, they have a wonderful reputation for this program. So I'm glad that you had the opportunity to do that. And Gary, I believe you kind of put the bug in the, in the wheel, didn't you, to get it started? <laughs> and that's great. <laughs> What, what was the passion that you saw when you first went to that workshop? I guess it was just meeting Sid, you know, seeing somebody that was keeping an old tradition alive. And that's, that's really what did it for me. It's like, it's, it's a tradition of this state. And I just, I was hooked. That is, that is great. So that's been about four years ago? Yeah, we started classes. Gary and I started in the evening program in January of 2009. And then Jerry uh, joined us in May, and we've been going pretty much ever since. So it's a, it's a family event, right? It's a family event. Well, that is great. That is great. Well, I'm so glad that you mentioned Montgomery because they do have a great program there. And I understand, Gary, that you could talk to me a little bit about a t couple of totem poles that have been made that you've been a part of. Yeah, uh, that was... Well, the first one we did was something we did for our, our class. And so we have one that we put up at school. And then we were asked by the Ashburn Zoo to build one for them. And so 
<clears throat> we took that project on, and it's in the final stages now. It's not complete, but it's close. That's awesome. That's awesome. I've already said earlier, I'm going to make a trip over to Montgomery. I want to see that one, and then I will have to go see the one at the Ashboro oh, Zoo, because I graduated from high school from Ashboro, so that's oh, a pretty nice. special place to me. Well, yeah. I think that's awesome and great that you all have done that, because it keeps a couple of old traditions going there, yeah. doesn't it? Talk to me about uh, what has been the favorite thing that you do in pottery, uh, in the glazing, the the throwing, the, you know, I'm learning some of these terms, so kind of tell me what that means. Well, probably for me, I'm, I'm very interested in the glazing, and um, we've taken a couple of glazing formulation classes under Bobby Listerman mm -hmm. at Montgomery Community College, mm -hmm. and uh, under her guidance and Mike Fariz, who is the lead potter there, um, we've, we've gotten a lot of information. Anyway, glazing interests me a lot, and I also I'm interested in decorating the pods. That's awesome. Um, That's wonderful. Do you all um, go to shows? Do you just put them in the gallery? How do, how do you show your wares? Well, we have gone <laughs> to a few shows, yeah. and we're anticipating going to more. But uh, at present, the only permanent exhibit we've got is at Falling Rivers. Is it the gallery? Well, I've already talked about this a lot in our show and in the other show that we did that was about the gallery that we're very blessed to have Falling Rivers and have a place that we can have our own and we can display all these awesome pieces of art that, that you all do. I think that you have found something that has been a great thing for your family. I think it's been a great thing that you enjoy and you're very passionate about it, so I'm sure there's going to be more and more years of doing this. I think that Gary is going to uh, demonstrate a little bit for us because in this show, we have seen a little bit of several steps of pottery making. We have gone to different pottery uh, workshops and, and the areas where they do their work, but Gary, I think you're going to do, we're finally gonna get to get some, <laughs> some of the clay thrown from the very beginning. So while we set up for that, thank you all so much for letting us come to your workplace, to let us talk to you, and uh, I'm sure that you're going to uh, enjoy the show when you get to see it, but other people will come to the gallery and see your wares as well. Well, so, we want to thank you for your interest. Oh, We're thank you very much. Oh, the the uh, gratitude all goes to you all, because we, uh, as I told you earlier, the college does this for us, and I love doing the shows. And it just, I just learned so much. So I'll tell you what, let's get ready for the, uh, the uh, exhibition of the throwing for the pottery.
have been talking today about the potters in Stanley County, the people who make this wonderful pottery that we see at the gallery, we see at other places, and we are so blessed, as I told you earlier in the show, that um, we are quickly becoming known for having uh, a great number of people who are in pottery here in the area, so that makes it very special. We are speaking now with Marianne and Jim Gant, and they are right here in Albemarle, and uh, I believe have been doing this for quite some time. We've talked a little bit before the show, but we'll talk a little bit more about it now, and then we'll get into how they got into it, but we want you to sit back and listen to these folks who take, as I say, just take the ground, just take dirt, and make something so beautiful out of it that all of us have the beauty to enjoy. Jim, let's talk to you first. Okay. What year did we get started in doing the pottery? Um, we started in uh, 1990. That was the year I went to work at Philip Morris. And uh, we had been in woodworking and we decided that we wanted to have a little more of a finished product. We were making small items for, for catalogs. And uh, so, um, we went to see uh, a lady in Seagrove, Sandra O'Quinn, and I watched her turn a pot and I asked her, uh, would you let me try that? She said, sure. So I sat down and centered the clay and turned a pot the first time. And that was it. That had you hooked right that there, it. didn't it? Yeah. And Marianne, did you start right away too? Yes, um, sort of. Now my first experience with pottery was in the early 70s when I was in college and I had done hand building and I, I really loved it but I never believed that I could make a job out of it and I never did get an opportunity to turn so after I saw him turn I thought well you know maybe I can do it too so then we enrolled in a course at um, Spirit Square in Charlotte and under the resident artist there we took turning and hand building and it was like nine weeks mm -hmm. nine, <clears throat> excuse nine me. Fridays. that got me that got me ready got you ready yeah that got me ready so we went to stanley Montgomery, uh not stanley montgomery but montgomery, montgomery community that's okay. montgomery community college and uh enrolled in their pottery classes there and the rest is history we were addicted we were really addicted both of our families were collectors so we grew up with pottery, and uh, we appreciated it from an early age. We both had uh, even antique pieces in our home from North Carolina pottery. So we studied it and everything. We studied the history of it and really, you know, we just, but we've pretty much tried to do our own thing. We've tried to not copy a particular artist or particular genre, but just do our own pottery. But well, that's I, awesome. I love Raku. That's my favorite. Well, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. that, too, and let you show favorite. us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's awesome that you two enjoy doing this so much together. And uh, we are filming this uh, for those of you who are watching the show right in the action. This is right in their studio where they do this. The kiln is going now. We have a piece that he's going to talk about, which makes it so special that it is something so unique. Jim, what's the greatest challenge about pottery? Well, for me, it's uh, um, uh, when I make it, I wind up with a lot of it, and I have to reduce my inventory. And I, I enjoy making it but, uh, more than mm -hmm. selling it. And, uh, and that's the challenge for me. The challenge. I, I can see that that would be once you get into the, the mode of something and it's looking good. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that is. Um, I have to stop. Right. <laughs> and we do a show or, or we have to get ready for it. And it takes time and effort. And I would rather be in the shop making and producing. Right. Speaking of, where do you all show your pottery? and Where do you have it for sale? Um, we have... Uh, some of these pots, I call the, these uh, feather pot, are at the uh, Mint Museum in Charlotte. Okay. They have yes, a handful sure. of those. Mm -hmm. We also, um, uh, we found Seagrove Pottery, which is 
at the square in Seagrove. Uh, Gene King owns that business and his brother, uh, David. David King. And they have four Seagrove potteries. They have one in Seagrove, one in Raleigh, one in Chapel Hill, and one in Carborough. Mm -hmm. So we take most of what we make to them. And we also do um, Christmas Made in the South at the Cabarrus Arena. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, great show. we mm -hmm. have done the Baden Festival for years. Right. And we now are, are in recent past, we've been a part of the Heritage uh, area where we set the wheel up and turn for the public. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and I know you do some teaching. Yes. Uh, and I know. Um, you were showing me something while ago right. that you were teaching. Talk well, to us a little bit about okay. that. Um, we started out teaching in the gallery, mm -hmm. Falling Rivers Gallery. Right, right. And um, I'm trying to develop a paint your own pottery, but it's developed now into a decorate your own pottery because we use appliques, 3D appliques and paint to decorate plates, tiles, uh, picture frames, Christmas ornaments, and it's from children through adults, eight, ages eight and up. And I will be doing three more classes this summer at the gallery. Oh, wonderful. They will advertise, hopefully, and I will right, too. they will. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my husband will be teaching um, Raku pottery uh, jewelry. necklaces, jewelry. He, we both do the jewelry, but he's teaching the technique because he's got it down to a science. And <laughs> and it's very beautiful, and that will be in the, the same days that I teach. He teaches in the morning, and I teach in the afternoon. Oh, that's awesome. And we love it. And I hope to continue the decorating um, here or at the gallery, but the next three classes will be at the gallery. Yeah. What an awesome way, then, too, for children to get to, yes. to use their, their talents yes. and their skills. You mentioned Raku. Marianne, tell me what does that word mean, a little bit about the history of this form of art. Okay, um, Raku is a Japanese uh, pottery art form, and it's ancient from early times. It was used in the tea ceremony, and it means, the word Raku means happiness or pleasure, and um, we've adapted it in this country to just being a glazing technique, which entails uh, bringing the raku in a in a fuel fired kiln up to a certain temperature and then reducing it in a reduction chamber filled with combustibles such as paper, sawdust, or pine needles, and the reduction process is what brings out the colors in it. It starves the oxygen out of the clay and out of the glaze, and you're left with the pure uh, colorants, the pure oxides and that's where your metals and your colors come from. And it's a very unique form of glazing. It's not useful for food use. It's only decorative, but it makes beautiful jewelry and beautiful uh, decorative pieces. Patience. It yeah. has to take a world of patience to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, just focusing on what you're doing, not what else you've got to do. Yeah. And, uh, and creative, and the, the right. creativity of it has just overwhelmed me because I've always appreciated it, loved the beautiful pottery, knew we had lots of potters, know it takes a lot of work, but learning as much as we have just discussed in these right. interviews, mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing, an amazing form of art. Tell me a little bit about this piece right here. We have the big these, one and the little these one. These are the same. Um, I call these a feather pot. Um, this pot is heated up in the Raku kill to 1750 degrees and it's taken out hot. Um, I have a, a device that I lift it from the inside um, and I take feathers and there's a, there's a window of opportunity. If I put the feather on the pot too soon, it burns it off. It'll burn it, and then oh, it'll go to white. I can see that. Well, that would if be. I do it too late, it looks great, but when I wash the pot, it'll wash off. So there's a, a moment. There, there. There's a moment that it works, and so um, when it gets to that moment, I'm taking a feather, and I'm taking my fingers and getting it close, 
and I'm taking a knife blade and touching it to where it lays on the pot and the heat consumes it and creates a carbon shadow is what I call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always put an odd number of feathers on the pot and uh, when I take it out I set it down on some uh, wood shavings so that gives the bottom um, uh, a starting point so it's not white down here. I want the, the black bottom and then the black to start up the sides. Once the feathers are done I use uh, uh, an etching chemical as ferric chloride which is uh, something we have to be very careful with. We don't want to breathe it, breathe it mm -hmm. so we're um, we're, we're very careful when right. we put that on. But it's put on with a spray and wherever it touches is the, the, the red. So I'm, I'm um, um, spraying in um, strokes, so to speak, wherever I want it. Okay. And so I have control of how dark it gets or how light it stays. And I have some where I put very little and I leave white. And, and it's what strikes me is what the pot wants. In other words, I'm, I'm trying to make it, You're trying make to, it tell me what to do. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing process to make the beauty that comes from it and the difference in this and this. I want to switch gears though a little bit here and uh, talk to you about something that's been very near and dear to this community and I know you all have been a big part of that and that is how the potters give back to the community and that is the Empty Bowl Project that has been done now for several years mm -hmm. for the Stanley County Christian Ministry. And I know I'm quite proud of my bowls and I <laughs> use them and I have one I think for every year. But how many do you all usually have ready for each we, of the events? We try to have 300 ready. Um, we don't. Well, but the empty the, bowls. The, the, bowls. Yeah, the we, different we, ones we, right. we do about 50 bowls and then we try to have a, a one or two Pots it's uh, right. Teresa and Ken Hunsucker are sort of over that, and they will set up a day that they call the Bowlathon, where the potters meet and bring their wheels, and we make it sort of a fun time. That's or awesome. you know, we try to gear I it up. I knew you did something yeah, we like did that. A, it's to get, it's to drum up excitement for it. And the among, public can come too. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. I know people that have gone there yeah. and done that. We've which turned uh, up to up to 50 bowls a piece, maybe more than that. That was all we got, I got. But then uh, we've had a lot of challenges this year, Jim and I have, but we still were able to participate. Well, I know you and, were there at the, and yeah, handing and out the bowls and participating. Oh, we always like to come to the event. And uh, we have a silent auction where uh, right. potters and even other uh, businesses in the area can donate something, an item from a store or a gift certificate, something for the silent auction and 100% of the proceeds go to the Christian Ministries Food Bank to feed the hungry. It's a, the soup is donated right, by businesses. Right. And people, so, volunteers cook right. at the church, Central Methodist right. donates their fellowship hall and um, Stanley Community Christian Ministries oversees it and we have a lot of community participation and it's just a wonderful way to give back to the community and help fight world hunger on a local level. It really is mm -hmm. and I've, I've been so uh, in, excited about that and interested ever since yeah. it started and I know that's my church and I know that's your church where great, you grew up Oh yes, and where the building is but yet we, it's not it's, my church and your church doing it, it's, it's everybody, everybody because it's... Well, there's so much about this and it is so interesting to watch and we uh, we will we will have some footage to share in the program that our folks will get to see that uh, I think they will be amazed as have I been about what it takes to make such a thing a beauty uh, with a creative uh, mind and also uh, it's a very analytical thing. I mean, there's a lot of technicality that goes oh. into this. And you guys are just amazing at what you do. I am, I am so uh, pleased to see that it's something you enjoy doing together and that you haven't, um, it hasn't grown old to you. You've been doing it for all these years, and you constantly are looking for something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is an, it's amazing how much that you do know. And we certainly appreciate 
uh, the options that we have here in the area mm -hmm. uh, to see your pottery and to buy your pottery. And uh, I have a piece in my house that I've had since before I even knew you all that was a gift. And I love it. And uh, that's what makes pottery so special. Mm -hmm. And uh, also what you do about the community projects and how you do that. So we thank you very much for spending this time with us and uh, so that we can share with our community what it's like in Stanley County and this close part of our region uh, in pottery. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. We're going to look just very quickly at a few things, Marianne, that you have shared with us. And uh, this it was so unique. Tell us about what you're doing here. Well, this is... Um, my decorate your own pottery. I would call it paint your own pottery, which was what it started out to be. But then I thought, well, we can put the 3D add-ons. Um, this is for ages eight and up. Right, these you mentioned that about the class. Then, these particular frames I do not make, but I do make these, uh, these mold. I have these uh, shells were made from molds, which we made from real shells that we found at the ocean. And this is uh, something that the painting technique and the mo uh, the placing the shells where you want them are, is a class that I teach. It's using um, bubble painting to give you the effect of the ocean and then shells, but you can do trees, anything. And these are the classes that I will be offering this summer at the Falling Rivers Gallery. Now then these shells, just so everybody understands, are these shells that you have made in the molds right and then you yes. then I what you do is you actually you glue them on after you've painted your your piece however mm -hmm. you want it you could paint fish all over it or people that you know stick people anything you wanted to paint it's very simple it's very individual and it allows the student to be as creative as they would like so you paint the shells paint the shells if you would like and then you glue the shells on the frame with just wood well, glue. They, the color is beautiful because right. it looks just like you've picked them up off the sand and oh, put it them does. there. They're but just beautiful. Once you glue these onto the frame, I take the frame home mm -hmm. and I glaze it with a clear glaze. Now you've painted it, you've put your shells, you've colored everything the way you want it, and then the student comes back a week later and they receive this. Awesome. The glaze holds the shells on there. It's That's all great. glazed on there. So well, I think, folks, you can see that we have the classes coming up. This is an educational part of what our uh, art guild, our pottery guild, our gallery, the people who and this <clears> do this are offering to the community. So watch for those dates now. And tell us about this necklace real quickly there. Now, Jim will teach a class that is a two-part class. Mine is only a one-part class, but you have to pick it up a week later. Jim's, he will have the student make the medallion and make the bead as well. And then he will, uh, they will come back the next week after he has bisked it that week, which is the pre-firing that you have to do to make it solid. He will come back and they will learn to glaze it and fire it themselves, and then he will place it on the cord and put a, he hammers out a copper, S -hook. yeah, S-hook. This is, this one doesn't have the S-hook, but he completes the necklace, that and they will awesome. have a complete necklace at the end, well, at least one. What a personal, beautiful mm -hmm. uh, piece of jewelry. So thank you for showing us these two things. I mm -hmm. think we're gonna look at a couple other things, right. and we'll. Uh, I've asked Jim to show us a couple other uh, unique uh, po possibilities that you all would enjoy that they do that some of these I had never seen before and they're absolutely lovely. Jim, I want you to talk about these beautiful dishes and the napkin rings that have leaves on them and okay. are just gorgeous. And tell us about the process. Okay. How do you get there? Well, um, we start out <clears throat> with a leaf. These leaves are from the Royal Palonia um, and it they grow wild and we have also cultivated some and uh, I pick them when they're the size that I want and I roll the clay out into a slab and I have a thickness that I shoot for and I take the leaf and lay it on the clay and take a rolling pin and roll it into the clay and then I form it into a bowl 
And then this is the bowl with the leaf still in it um, uh, in the drying process. After a week of drying, it'll go into the bisque and the leaf will burn out and leave a little residue. It'll be washed and dried again. And then it comes out looking like this. Now this is a bis pot. You can handle it and um, it will absorb water. When I dip this in the glaze, the water that is absorbed into the pot leaves the glaze on the surface. So I can control the amount of glaze on here by leaving the pot in the glaze two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and that builds it up. So different glazes have different thicknesses. You were asking about the... Yes, the napkin rings. These napkin rings, these are hydrangea. Uh, my wife uh, donates these from her hydrangea plants. And um, we uh, roll the slab out and we take the leaves and place them on the slab. And I take a rolling pin and roll them into the clay. I cut them out with a, a needle tool and uh, roll them up into a napkin ring. They're fired, they're washed, and then they're glazed. A beautifully done, beautifully they're done. Nice. So and this unique. Is, and this is the process for all stoneware. Uh, we make it, we bisque fire it, and then we glaze it, and then we fire it again. And it may, and the stoneware will hold water, where the raku that we've shown right. will not hold water. The stoneware by itself will hold water, and it also has a glaze that, uh, uh, which is just glass. So stoneware, just before we close out this segment, stoneware, mm -hmm. you can eat out of, you can wash, right. you can wash it, you it. can microwave right. it. it. It's a stone. It's a stone. It right. becomes a stone, and those are the things that are so often used in the coffee mugs. And That's right. That kind of thing, but the gorgeous, gorgeous decorative raku and the, the uh, beautiful pots that you have shown us, those are strictly for looks. And beautiful. And beautiful. with us today for this most unusual program in our series of arts in Stanley County. When we started this program in January, 
we sat down and we thought and we wrote down the different kind of art form that is being done right in our own community. I don't think you know how many art forms are being done because we certainly were amazed at the list ourselves. I want to thank Stanley Community College, every program that we do, for sharing this gift with you and to James Cotton who produces this entire program and as I say uses his magical touch to bring it all together and for the privilege that I have just to interview these wonderful people and to share with you how wonderful this community really is. This art of pottery has been so interesting and I want to thank the people that we have interviewed. We've interviewed Nancy Leip, Jim and Marianne Gant, the Williams in Oakborough, and we have been on site right until this very end. And we have a surprise ending for you today. Don't forget to watch our program and, the, and to share with other people to watch the program. Let us know what you like about it and let us know how much you appreciate the college giving this gift to our community. But we have a surprise today. We have Jim and Mary Ann still with us at their studio and they have told me that when you do this, it's like Christmas morning. Because earlier you saw the filming of this pot being put into this reduction chamber. Am I right on that, Jim? And now we're going to have the unveiling of what does this look like when we opened it. So I suppose we really need a drum roll. But Jim, it's all yours. Okay. Oh. And it's different. Is that not absolutely beautiful. amazingly beautiful? And what a form that only... See the copper? Yes, yes. It's got the little sparkles in it and the blue around it.